Last, but certainly not least, competitive interactions. This is our most complicated model, but it is, I think, our most useful. So what we're trying to do here is identify the conditions that maintain biodiversity. In doing that, we also end up identifying conditions that lead to species extinction. Um, we can then, uh, what we're going to do is go into these models and identify the lock of Volterra conditions that lead to either extinction or coexistence. And by the end of this, you should be able to recognize what is likely to occur uh, given some preset uh, set of conditions. That's our goal. Cool. So competition as an idea is not one that's foreign to us. We Trees compete for all kinds of uh, resources. I mean, competition uh, happens in all kinds of environments, but or all kinds of ways. Uh, there's a grandmaster competing against a computer, I'm pretty sure. Um, but, you know, trees, as we have focused on quite a lot in this course, trees uh, compete with each other for water, lights, and nutrients, and sometimes other factors, but primarily those three things. Um, I want to just kind of put one throw one other thing out there just to uh, circle back to the Yellowstone wolves because they're so cool. Um, but, you know, competition happens with, between all kinds of organisms, including predators. And wolves in particular um, uh, compete against coyotes and they actually predate on them. So that's an uh, interesting way that you have all, like, all, all, all aspects of these things interacting at once. Okay, so anyway, back to forests, right? Uh, we're talking about, there, there are a couple of assumptions that we're going to assume here. We're going to assume that our forest that we're interested in is uh, limited by a single uh, resource. Uh, that's just um, going to make things easier for now. Um, and that organisms are, are struggling for an advantage and they're capitalizing on, on that resource in order to do it. Um, the other thing is that these populations perfectly overlap uh, and are and are limited by the same resource uh, dynamics, um, even if they're even when they're re re limited to a greater or lesser extent, and that's going to be the key. So, where does this apply? Well, it applies in any time we have a mixed stand. So, whether it's coast live oak and bay laurel, or Douglas fir and tan oak, or any number of species that you might be interested in interacting in a real system. Okay, and we're going to start with something that. We've already talked about, and that's um, our uh, our uh, constrained growth. Now, another way to talk about constrained growth that it is a representation of intraspecific competition. That is competition that is occurring among members of the same species. If you have decreasing birth rates or increasing death rates with lower resources, you are essentially modeling intraspecific competition within one species. Now, what we are actually trying to do here is model inter-specific competition, which occurs between species. Now, the trick is that in order to understand the competition between species, one must also account for competition within species. So think about which of these applies in what conditions. So, what I'm going to do here is just rewrite um, our logistic growth in just a, a very, very nuanced way. So it's the same equation, but we're adding in some effect of competition from another species. And that's this here, some function of the size of another species. So this is the constrained growth under normal conditions. And then what we do is we add this other species. What we have now are two populations, two growth rates, and two carrying capacities. But um, the other thing I forgot is that there's some effect of each population on the other, and we assume it's negative. And the way that we, we model that is we say, how much does each of individual, uh, each individual population two negatively affect species one and vice versa? So that's, that's what you have here. This is this uh, representation of when uh, uh, the, the effect of each individual of species two on species one and vice versa. And again, don't get lost in the math here. What we're talking about are real trees, real species, real things that you have touched and measured and I think care about, such as coast live oak and bay laurel or 
um, any number of species that coexist. Here's an, another example, and this is um, Douglas fir invading a grassland on Mount Tamalpais. There is competition between the grass, grassland community, grasses, and Douglas fir here. And um, if you want to maintain grass, grassland communities, which is a priority here, then you probably want to understand the conditions where one or the other is going to have an advantage. If you want to, well, you want to understand when the grasses are going to have an advantage over the trees. Okay, and then here's a last example. This is Douglas fir and tan oak in um, near Willow Creek, California. This is a timber stand, you know, uh, maintaining timber growth and, um, and this resource means you need to understand how much Douglas fir regeneration and growth is going to be limited by these other species. If you know that, then it will help you uh, identify when you might need to do some treatments, thinning, uh, herbicides, burning, maybe some other things. Okay, practical value. All right, so, and there is supplemental material that goes into this in a little bit better detail. I'm going to run through it really fast. How does this play out? Well, we can plot these in the same space. Again, we've got species one here and species two here. And what I'm, and we've got the isoclines, which are the same concept as um, for predator prey dynamics. And what we're going to do here is we're going to um, we're going to we're going to define these isoclines based on the carrying capacity of each species and its interspecific competitive effect. So what we're going to do here is I've got carrying capacity of species one or species two. That's the red line, um, and then species one here. They go on different axes, and then I am going to identify their negative effects here. So this is all the characteristics of species one. Its carrying capacity, which is intraspecific competition, affects itself. And then its effect on the second, second species, the interspecific effect, which again is a ratio of its population size uh, divided by its, um, the negative effects of the other species. Okay? Really clear, right? Um, yes, or the negative effects of, the, of, the, of that species, or on, of, of uh, yeah. Anyway, okay. <laughs> anyway, so when we plot the um, when we plot these uh, characteristics of these systems uh, on in this kind of space, we can get an idea of who will win in an um, in a mixed species environment, say in a mixed species stand. In this case, the carrying capacity of first species and its negative effect on the second species are all much larger than. The first species. So uh, always, always this will result in competitive exclusion of the second species. Always. This system will always grow to the carrying capacity of first species. Likewise, if you reverse these, you will get the opposite outcome. You will grow the system to the um, carrying capacity of the second species when its interspecific inter competitive effects are larger than the first species. Um, and its intra-specific intra comp competitive effects are smaller. It's competing less with itself and more with the other species, and that's a recipe for a competitive exclusion. That tells you when you could have extinction of species in one particular uh, population growth condition. Again, I think that's really valuable. Okay, so let's uh, switch this around a little bit. Um, Again, you know, here we're excluding, uh, you know, I'm excluding the, the, the first species um, uh, again. Okay. Um, but what happens when, say, we have, um, we have this condition where species are not interacting very strongly inter, interspecifically, but are actually much more constrained intraspecifically within each species? Here, what you're going to have is when you're above these isoclines, you're going to have negative growth. And when you're below them, you're going to have positive growth. So the, the uh, populations are growing towards this point. But in this area, if you're above this isocline, this one's going to grow in a negative way, and this one's going to grow positively. And again, it's all going to go to this uh, central point. This is a recipe for coexistence. Strong intraspecific competition and weak interspecific competition. 
the um, if you switch these around, you get something else. You can get coexistence, but it is um, unstable. Both uh, species will grow positively when they're below their isoclines and negatively when they're above them. But in this area here and in this area here, you can have competitive exclusion. This kind of unstable equilibrium is still valuable for maintaining biodiversity because systems, real systems don't exist in this kind of vacuum. There's a lot more variation, variation in the environment, um, you know, pests and pathogens, all kinds of things that can modify this. And these uh, unstable equilibria can end up helping to maintain biodiversity in natural ecosystems. That happens a lot. I mean, I had this, you know, showed you this example of, of Douglas fir, and yet historically, Douglas fir has not always uh, been an issue in these areas. It hasn't always been so successful in invading grasslands. What's changed on Mount Tamalpais in the last 200 years? It burns a lot less because we're not starting fires there uh, as a management tool. And because of that, the competitive balances have shifted in many places. What's the answer? Well, you can cut the trees as the agency is doing here, or you can reintroduce fire, or you can do both. Both are a good idea. Here's another example, and um, this is the dense understory that uh, can emerge in, in some areas. This is a problematic fuel condition. I, uh, it's again related to um, suppression of fire, and it, uh, this kind of condition also happens with some diseases like sudden of death, dense re-sprouting. And what's the answer here? You've changed the equilibrium dynamics. What's the answer? Well, you may need to intervene and address this in, in some way through management. So again, these are tricky um, concepts in our class. They're, um, they can be a real, they, they take a, lot, a fair amount of work to really master these four, these four kinds of population dynamics and to recognize when you, where they apply. But I really believe in it as a topic of this class because the tools that it gives you, the insights into when you might have to do management or how some resource that you care about changes, and, you know, the insights are really worth it. So that's why I think it's worth your time and I hope that we talk more about these as, um, as we wrap up the class.